Uh, my name is uh, Tom Abercrombie. I'm a faculty here in the anthropology department and co-organizer of this uh, colloquium series and of course a graduate seminar that goes along with it with uh, Rafael Sanchez. <coughs> Raise your hand, Rafael. <coughs> who is faculty in, in the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies here. Um, I'd like to welcome you all here this evening to this uh, third out of seven uh, talks in a, in a series that uh, we have called, uh, I'm going to read it off here, <coughs> Patrimony, Space, and Performance in Latin American Cities. It's a series that aims to query Latin American cities as sites for the performance and contestation of authority, rights, and personhood. We really are attempting to address in the course and in the, in the series both a series of, of fundamental questions. Are Latin American cities palimpsests of social memory haunted by the coloniality of social relations bound into their structures? How do their 16th century roles as global cities play into their siting within 21st century global networks? How have gated communities, urban renewal, or UNESCO patrimony programs reshaped them as theaters of signification? What are the implications of social movements seeking reversion of sovereignty and patrimony or of rising rates of violence and fear in Latin American cities? Uh, today we're not starting with violence and fear, <coughs> but uh, going back to a, a kind of theater of power in the Baroque era. And um, before I introduce our speakers, my thanks to Clax and to Title VI for the funding that makes this series possible. Uh, today we have a presenter and a discussant, as in every one of these series. Our presenter is Alejandra Osorio. She's Associate Professor of History at Wellesley College and author of, I meant to bring the book to hold it up and wave around. <coughs> for, for those of you who can discussant. afford this book, I hope your royalties are right. really good. <laughs> They're not. But I'm guessing not, no. <laughs> Um, a wonderful book uh, titled Inventing Lima, Baroque Modernity in Peru's South Sea Metropolis, published by Palgrave Macmillan in 2008. Uh, discussing the paper is Barbara Mundy, who is Associate Professor of Art History at Fordham University, specializing the art in the art of colonial Latin America. She's author of The Mapping of New Spain, Indigenous Cartography, and the Maps of the Relaciones Geográficas, published by the University of Chicago Press in 1996 in a paperback edition, costing much less. In 2000, <laughs> and we're, we're hoping the for the same way up in that way. from Palgrave <laughs> Macmillan. Uh, Barbara is also a, a co-organizer uh, and author of a wonderful website uh, called Vistas, Visual Culture in Spanish America, 1520 to 1820. Uh, that, uh, the DVD is out at, with Texas this month. And the DVD mm -hmm. is just out with Texas, so I advise you all to, to take a look. It's a wonderful uh, learning and teaching tool. So without further ado, uh, please welcome uh, Alejandro Osorio. by um, saying that it's a really great pleasure to be back here uh, where um, I sort of began my academic career in 1985 when I was a graduate student in CLAGS and I was also uh, a graduate assistant to Saskia Sassen who was the first speaker <laughs> in the series and when I began to think about cities as complex objects of study I would like to thank Tom for inviting me and Plax for um, hosting the event and the audience for coming here tonight. Uh, my presentation today is very, uh, it's, um, 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 it's very much a work in progress on a new project tentatively titled The First Modern Imperial Baroque Modernity in the Spanish Habsburg World on the urban rituals that made possible the ruling of the vast uh, Spanish 
Habsburg Empire of the late 16th and 17th centuries. And hopefully, we'll, I'll, I'll get this, wait, this was supposed to be on play, but it isn't. Oh, what happened? Hold on a second. Technology is not one of my fortes here. Uh, US, what is the? You want to start from the beginning? No, I want to start from the beginning, but here the slideshow. Yeah, there you there. go. All right. Hopefully I get it down. All right. Um, this project stems from concerns and questions raised uh, by my prior research on the making of Lima as capital of the Viceroyalty of Peru, circa 1540 to 1700. As some of, uh, some of you might know already, unlike Mexico City, uh, which was founded and built as a Spanish city on top of and around the conquered Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan, Lima was built from scratch on the desert along the coast of South America. My book, titled Inventing Lima, which Tom already gave you the whole title, so I won't repeat it, uh, traced the transformation of a hamlet of ramshackle structures into the legitimate center of the viceregal court and thus of Spanish imperial power through a series of both civic and religious ceremonies and the pu published writings of those ceremonies. It was while researching uh, ceremonies for that book that I became aware of arguments about the modern and modernity as this concept was understood at the time or as the newly ma made and newly made that by virtue of its newness also lacked the authority of antiquity. The notion of a modern opposed to oldness, which is another way in which you could uh, translate antiguo, uh, <clears throat> were echoed in a variety of other writings, such as histories of the conquest, natural histories, chronicles of religious orders, histories of buildings, prosopographies, and so on. It was while at the John Carter Brown Library as a fellow in discussions particularly with scholars working on British America and on the global circulation of silver that I also became keenly troubled or uncomfortable with the language and concepts used to tell the story of 17th century America or with the use of the term colonial, which always meant pre-modern or simply not modern. I wrote much of Lima, uh, inventing Lima while living in the great metropolis of Mexico City, which made me think even deeper about the issue of language and of the importance of the conceptual framework used in the writing of what is still called colonial Latin America. This came about in part because in my discussions with colleagues there working on the 17th century, they kept re uh, referring to it as the Antiguo Regimen, or Mexico under the Ancien Regime, and which I found as problematic as the term colonial. It was also in the course of those discussions uh, that I became aware of yet another set of issues, or the many differences between the political cultures, structures, and practices of the two viceroyalties. So as a result, I concluded in uh, Inventing Lima that um, the city and the viceroyalty of which it was part, far from colonial and peripheral, was rather a modern Baroque metropolitan center in its own right. And that prompted me to look at this in the larger context of the entire empire now, both the European part and the um, overseas possessions. Now, why was it modern? First, let me state perhaps the obvious, that the discovery of the new world and the extension of the Holy Roman Empire to include these new possessions posed new and unprecedented challenges to existing forms of political rule in the old world. And the not so obvious perhaps, that many of the solutions to, the, to uh, these new political challenges got worked out in the new world, first and later in the Philippines, before they were introduced and tried out in Europe. Among some such challenges and a central issue for imperial monarchical rule was the concern of how to make the king present everywhere, all the time, and accessible to a variety of different audiences worldwide. This problem necessitated new technologies of rulership on many levels. I see this period as modern because of several changes that in many ways are still with us today. First, let me just I'll point out a few. Um, in the political sphere, Europe was undergoing a process of centralization of power, both ecclesiastical and secular. Decentralization produced new geographies and spaces of power, not just in Europe, 
as one such space was that of the court, royal uh, in the case of Madrid and Paris, and viceregal in that of Naples, Lima, and Mexico. At the same time, there was a reconceptualization of the city, which reordered as well as redefined the urban and the rural, and you could argue that it invented those two terms and their relationship. And also a redefinition of the city's role in this new political courtly culture. In the case of the Spanish Empire, the massive founding of cities um, began shortly after the discovery of the New World and later the relocation of indigenous populations into Indian towns uh, undertaken in the 1570s and known as Reducciones, reflected this new urbanism based on the ancient but renewed concept of civitas, or the political life lived in cities. Civitas was also the notion of the city as a rationally ordered civic body, and here the concept of policia embodies this idea best, I think. The techne, in the Foucauldian sense, or technologies that made this rational order possible were first the urban layout or grid, but also the university, the censuses, padrones and visitas, new forms of record keeping of all sorts, notarial and parish records, but also all sorts of new uh, royal papers, mapping of territories, civil and religious law codes, um, the creation of archives and printing presses, ruled by, by proxy, the viceroy, but also the king's simulacra, ambassadorships, or the procuradores, a new system of patronage both in the arts, both broadly defined, but also economic, as well as a new urban ceremonial culture centered on the king's body. And here, I should move down. I should have moved this down before, that's Peru. <laughs> and I need to get to here. Okay. Now, in the religious sphere, there was also centralization of religious power around Rome and the Pope, at the same time that there was a move towards an increased secularization of powers. And here, the peculiar institution of the Patronato Real, for example, or royal patronage of the Spanish American Church, is an instance of this, I think as in a series of papal bulls issued in 1493, 1501, 1508, and 1538, Rome essentially relinquished control over all aspects of running, financing, nominating, and inspecting clerics and churches in the New World to the Spanish king in perpetuity. I would also argue that the creation of the quote-unquote modern inquisition in Spain circa 1518, when Castile and Aragon are co-joined in one jurisdiction for the first time, and in the Americas in 1570 in the Viceroyalty of Peru, and a year later in that of New Spain, constitute another instance of this same process. There were additional efforts to further centralize in the 1640s, followed by another one circa 1680, which further split the strictly civic from the religious. This is evident in Peru, for example, in the 1680s, with the government of the Duke of La Palata, who ruled between 1681 and 1689, which I think marks a new political order in the case of the Viceroyalty. And um, it's a change that has usually been attributed to the Bourbons, but I think that it begins before. The broader context for this interplay of religious power was a counter-reformation Catholicism that sought to standardize religious practice and beliefs by eliminating a vast medieval and somewhat pagan system of patron uh, saint worship in the interest of a more streamlined set of devotions centered on the Eucharist, Jesus and Mary, and a few strategically chosen martyrs and a much reduced, reduced uh, <laughs> pantheon of saints. By the 17th century, the church also promoted religious education and the use of catechisms in native languages. As Tom Dandelet and Anna Kureth before him have argued, the Spanish Habsburgs deployed a new culture of sainthood where the promotion of saints in Rome became important currency in the economy of favors that ordered all social and political relations during the Habsburg 17th century. <clears throat> By the 17th century, there were also new systems of production and labor in place, such as the Corvée labor or Mita, for example, which serviced large-scale mining, agriculture, textile manufacturing, and so on, and a new system of uh, commerce, exchange, and circulation of goods, and also new patterns of consumption. And this was not just in Europe, but also in the New World. By the 17th century, the world, pretty much as we know it today, was commercially integrated and very productive. 
This economic integration created um, a social revolution of sorts as it made possible new forms of social mobility and patterns of consumption. It also made products traditionally reserved for a very small uh, elite available well beyond its confines. This was the case with imports of Chinese silks, for example, velvets, silk and velvet uh, slippers and silk stockings um, that you see in some of these images. Um, and pearls from Panama to places like coastal Lima and French lace to the interior highlands of the vice, uh, Southern Viceroyalty where they could now be purchased um, at much lower prices than their European counterparts by non-elite member uh, men and women, thus rendering expensive dress or luxurious dress and the sumptuary laws that regulated it essentially meaningless as a marker of distinction. This new economy uh, an urban ceremonial culture not only created new desires for these products, but also new economic interests and elites, as David Statnicki has very ably uh, recently shown in his study of the Portuguese merchants under Spanish Habsburg rule. Um, <coughs> these changes were all further embedded in a new cultural practice where the space of political action was the theatrical, or the teatrum publicum, uh, or a space of public scrutiny. The stage of this culture of public scrutiny was, of course, the city, and in the 17th century Habsburg overseas possession, the Plaza Mayor, and the space immediately adjacent to it. It was in this central space of power that life got played out in the 17th century. The central political actor in this space was the king, ever present in the buildings that surrounded the main plaza and in the numerous ceremonial perf uh, ceremonies performed in it throughout the year. It was also the figure and image of the king that held society together and functioning as a cohesive body politic or cuerpo politico. Central to the, culture, um, the cultural viability of the political system of new empires such as that of the Habsburg Empire, um, the Spanish Habsburg was the presence of the king in the form of simulacra. The Habsburg Empire was made up of a worldwide and utterly desperate composite, uh, composite of all principalities, kingdoms, and former empires, which had enjoyed independent separate existences for centuries with political institutions and traditions of their own. A fundamental issue for the composite Spanish monarchy then from Charles V forward was how to make the monarch present in his many remote dominiums and in this manner unite them. The manner in which the king's simulacra was distributed was not so different from those Baroque technologies of the church that produced and disseminated countless ceremonials and images of God Almighty, the Holy Eucharist, Jesus Christ, the Virgin Mary, the martyrs, and the saints, all enclosed in and or framed by magnificent architecture. It is surprising then that the figure of the Spanish king in distant, uh, distant possessions remains largely unexamined. Um, this leads me to, into um, what was Baroque about this modern. And here are some of the simulacrum that is used um, to represent the king. The Baroque was first introduced in the 19th century as a period concept in, the, in art history when it was uh, used primarily to focus on the morphological aspects of this art form. In literature, it was used to differentiate between the rhetorical and conceptual versions of the Baroque literature of the mid to late 17th century. For Antonio Maraval, who published the by now um, canonical culture of the Baroque, first in Spanish in Barcelona in 1975 and later in English in 1986, on the other hand, quote, the Baroque was a historical concept belonging to and therefore affecting the sphere of social history. He defined it as, quote, a culture provoked by a social crisis of major proportions, which was felt in all of Europe and perhaps worse in Spain. The idea of the culture of the Baroque allowed Maraval to extend the notion of crisis beyond the realm of pure economics into the broader realm of um, the changing character of cultural history and social life, taking place in the 17th century. More importantly, for my purposes, in Maraval's view, the Baroque culture of the 17th century was urban, guided from above, responsible for creating a mass culture, and finally, a conservative one. He found it um, he found that it was the perception of crisis and instability 
uh, found among the groups of power and those of the middle strata of society who identify with them that brought about the political program of the Baroque around 1600. The Baroque then was a culture of reaction, reaction against the mobility and change that for much of the 16th century had threatened to erode the hierarchical construction, construction of estates or estados. In Spain, this was according to Maraval, a contrived and manipulated culture for the benefit of the monarchy and its nobility as a way to deal with the changes that seemed to turn their world upside down, thus promoting the development of techniques to captivate minds and neutralize individual potential dissenters in the cities. In this argument and some of his, um, in his arguments and some of his followers, this captivation of, of the mind was achieved through terror, as with the Inquisition, as well as more benign forms of control such as the theater, sermons, and emblematic literature, all geared towards causing admiration and suspense, but also by the use of firework, fountains, and the ever-present fiesta. In short, this was a culture directed to the masses, defined as the multitude of anonymous and therefore potentially disruptive individuals concentrated in the cities with a message su um, suggesting the desirability of integration within the confines of an essential status structure. And here we have some images of Needless to say that there are as many adherents as there are detractors from this view. Fernando de la Flor, for example, sees the Baroque as a culture of encuadramiento, or a sort of inescapable hegemonic matrix that entraps the individual, disallowing any political individual act, uh, action or counteraction against an all-encompassing system of images, economy of the ephemeral and the superfluous, uh, prescribed behaviors, and so on, that numb the mind and the body, <clears throat> and that in the process bankrupts not only the royal treasury, but also society in sort of a moral way. Others have seen the Baroque as irrational because of its Catholic and Spanish origins, but also due to an understanding of rituals as irrational or emotional empty performances, or simply as other, exotic and equally empty of content. Carlos Fuentes, for example, has argued that, quote, the Baroque is the language of abundance and also the language of insufficiency, as only those who possess nothing include everything. And who could argue with that? More recently, Patricia Yeager, editor of the Journal of the Modern Language Association, um, PMLA, in her introduction to a special issue on the Baroque and the new Baroque, called for an understanding of the Baroque as a spirit rather than as a historical style. Perhaps, for my purposes here, more useful is William Edgington's uh, point that, quote, the Baroque must be understood as the aesthetic counterpoint, uh, counterpart to a problem of thought that is conterminous uh, with, that in the we with that time in the West we have learned to call modernity, stretching from the 16th century to the present. The problem of appearance and the reality they purport to, re uh, to represent. Bradley Nelson has also noted that ritual is not something rationalism leaves behind, but it is instead at the very heart of rationalism and modernity's effort to mark an ontological break with the past. William Childers, on the other hand, has called for an understanding of the Baroque as a dis uh, distinctive modernity where rather than an inescapable hegemonic matrix, he finds a Baroque public sphere that worked differently from the bourgeois public sphere predicated on the apparent or presumed transparency of print and coffee houses, but that nonetheless afforded venues of participation and political agency in spectacle and rumor, which is how he translates uh, the 17th century concept of publico inodorio. In a different context, Natalia Silva Prada has made a similar argument about the importance of rumors for the 17th century public sphere in the political culture of Mexico City. My own research, my new research, is concerned with some of these issues as well. And this takes me now to my current research on some of the technologies that made possible um, the rule of the Spanish Empire in the 17th century. So within this framework of the Baroque as modern and not necessarily as conservative, economically unproductive, or simply as a culture directed from above, understood here to mean as directed from the royal court in Madrid. 
I am interested in tracing the development of certain technologies of empire ruling and their workings in the composite Spanish monarchy. One such technology is the archive, as bo both a, as a symbolic and material space for the safekeeping of certain kinds of printed materials and their role in the creation of a historical memory as well as the uh, constitution of an orderly republic or civitas. And here, I should say from the outset that I'm not interested in not the, the notaries or you know, the notarial records. I'm, I'm interested in, 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 in sort of the space of the archive as a symbolic um, space, not, not how it worked necessarily uh, internally. And another uh, technology is the use of the royal simulacra in urban ceremonies and the way in which these two work in the creation of an urban imperial geography of power. Um, today I'm going to outline a little bit of what I've been doing because this is research that I just completed <laughs> in the last eight months and I haven't really had you know, much distance yet to figure out what I'm doing, but this is tentative. <laughs> During the 17th century, the staging of ceremonies centered on the body of the Spanish king was an essential aspect of monarchical rule in his vast empire. These ceremonies were also important to the city's political self-fashioning organized within a complex urban hierarchy that structured space in a network of cities, towns, villas, pueblos, and ports in the kingdoms and provinces of his numerous possessions. Although the royal ceremonies that commemorated the passing of one king and proclaimed the succession of another uh, could be far less frequent than the ceremonies of the royal standard performed annually in every city of his empire during the commemoration of the founding of that city, uh, or the viceregal entries, kingly rituals were nonetheless of great significance for the cultural establishment and maintenance of political allegiances to the distant monarch. And this is because uh, there's uh, an oath that it's taken uh, between the monarch and the um, vassals or the subjects in every one of these ceremonies. The figure of the king and the ceremonies that surrounded his body and image were important elements of a ritual or theatrical idiom of imperial rule that staged the political relationship between the distant monarch and his subjects as one of intimacy and benevolence. And this is something that you cannot do when the king is there in his body or this body. In a word, these ceremonies created and managed a royal presence that could be seen, heard, and touched sometimes. The space for this royal theater was the city and the place, the Plaza Mayor. One major effect of this theater of rule appears to have been the cultivation or confirmation of strong fidelities towards the king among all segments of the Spanish world body politic and which might explain to a certain extent the longevity of this empire in spite of trying moments of crisis and decline. Let me just go through some of the images of this um, catafalques and you know, the structures that are built for these ceremonies around the image of the king. That's by, by regal entry. And <coughs> um, Royal ceremonies were used by various imperial cities, where the viceregal capitals of Lima and Mexico City are just two among many, in their self-fashioning as the head city or cabeza of the composite body politic or republic of their respective kingdoms, viceroyalties, provinces, and so on. This was the case, for example, with the Italian kingdoms of Sicily and Naples, where the city of Palermo, which obtained the title of city from Charles V during his progress um, through the Italian peninsula on his way back to Spain after defeating Barbarossa in Africa in the early 16th century, fought in the 17th century a long fight to preserve its privileges and status vis-a-vis -vis those of the rising city of Messina and the viceregal capital of Naples across the ocean or the, the sea there. Something similar happened between Lisbon in the Kingdom of Portugal and Madrid before it became the seat of the royal court uh, during the period of the union of the two crowns between 1580 and 1640. In 1580, Lisbon petitioned the king Philip I and II of Castile and Leon and so on to establish his royal court there. Later, in the 1620s, after obviously they didn't succeed, Lisbon petitioned again to have the court moved from the now established capital in Madrid to the Portuguese city of Lisbon. 
these disputes in Europe closely resemble those between New World cities. In my book, I showed how the ceremonies of the royal exegies and the king's proclamation constituted important currency in the pro uh, production of Vice Regal Limas's courtly aura, uh, aura during that period of its dispute with the former Inca capital of Cusco for the title of head city of the Vice Royalty of Peru in the 17th century. I will suggest here that, as with the case of Lima, cities in the Spanish Habsburg Empire more generally openly competed for status, favors, and or privileges and predominance within their own jurisdictions as well as within the larger empire. One such privilege actively sought by cities throughout the empire was membership in the Cortes of Castile, a body of 18 cities that provided revenues to the Spanish king in exchange for privileges and status, among other things, all of which in the end translated into important economic gains. Elsewhere, I show how this was articulated by different cities in the Viceroyalty of Peru. My current research revealed that this was also the case from early on in the formation of the Northern Viceroyalty of New Spain in disputes between Puebla de Los Angeles, for example, and the city of Tlaxcala, and also in the case of the Philippines. In all cases, a crucial element in this competition among Habsburg urban centers was ceremony, the staging of elaborate and magnificent public celebrations that could then be compared to those performed in other cities and pr in, in printed form as chronicles or relaciones de fiestas. These ceremonial performances were thought to reflect the relative social and material wealth, degree of civilization, power, status, and influence at court of the city in question. These points were very clearly articulated by the author of a relation of the proclamation of Philip V celebrated in Manila in 1712, where the chronicler argued that the narrative of his account would serve not only to educate readers about this distant possession, at the same time that it would also dispel any ideas they might have about the Philippines as backward and barbaric. The chronicler explicitly addressed those readers, quote, who might not have news of the city of Manila, of its greatness, authority, control, breadth and wealth and power, and who might also conceive of the cities and populations of the Indies and of the Philippines as simple and poor, and filled with huts in, inhabited only by barbarians and ignorant men whose livelihood depends on eating human flesh and who still have the blood of that flesh spilling out from their lips and running down their faces and who take pleasure in the performances of such cruel and horrendous carnage. He hoped that reading, quote, this truthful and short relation of the elaborate ceremonies performed for the king and the descriptions of the city in which they were performed would serve as correctives to this gross misunderstanding as well as uh, testimony of the love and loyalty to the king. It's a beautiful document. The privileged space of the, for these performances in Manila as in the New World was the Plaza Mayor. It was in this theatrical urban space that the display of the king's simulacra, particularly in his portrait, became an important form of cultural capital that sealed, for example, Limas's reputation as a kingly city and as such as head of all the rest. By the close of the 17th century, Limas's royal ceremonial life, for example, had successfully established the city of the kings, as it was then known, uh, as both the indisputable center of legitimate imperial power in the Viceroyalty of Peru and as one of the great cities within the larger empire. Something similar seems to have happened with cities in New Spain, the Philippines, within Spain, and also in Italy. Beyond the commonalities of these ceremonial performances and of their written forms, there were also some interesting and potentially important differences that seem to have shaped different local political cultures at the same time that they reflect different political structures. In Mexico City, for example, the climatic conditions described as, in the documents as sustained and copious rain that resulted in extremely muddy conditions shaped the material form of these ceremonies in the city in such a way that the public space of these performances was from early on seemingly more restricted than in the case of Lima. For the royal exegies performed for Mexi in, in Mexico City for Charles V in 1559, for example, the city built a wooden street, almost like a tunnel, 
as it also had a ceiling and a uh, wall-like uh, side that connected all the buildings uh, involved in the ceremony to protect the participants with their long and expensive robes from the elements and the mud. The public in the ceremony sat on bleacher-like stands set alongside those wooden streets. Over time, these uh, sorts of structures became a permanent fixture in these performances, conditioning the relationship of the ruling body with the people. As, much, uh, as such, the structures of this ceremony in Mexico was closer to those performed in Flanders uh, rather than in Lima, where no such structures were ever used. Another difference uh, potentially related to this one in its consequences was the fact that unlike Lima, where the viceroy was not present in the royal ceremonies of the exequies and proclamations in the 17th century because they coincided with interim governments of the Audiencia Real, in Mexico City, the viceroy was always present, as was his wife, the vicereen, who also played a very central role during the public condolences paid by the different official bodies of the viceroyalty before the royal funeral. The presence of the viceroy in Mexico meant, among other things that I'm trying to figure out right now, that the place and perhaps presence occupied by the king's simulacrum, his portrait, was very different in Mexico from that in Lima. While in Lima, the king sat comfortably during his proclamation in a grand stage in the Plaza Mayor, in Mexico, his portrait did not partake in the public ceremony until the 18th century. And here there's an inversion that, you know, it's sort of interesting to be looking at, but I can't say much about that yet. I have a few ideas that we can talk about in discussion. But. In Manila, on the other uh, hand, the king was present in his portrait during royal ceremonies, but the space of these ceremonies was greatly reduced from those in Lima and Mexico City, given that the city of Manila was a small walled fort built in the estuary of the Pasig River. And I have, um, that's Mexico. This is the city here, Manila, which is much, much smaller if you remember the other, the previous maps from Mexico City. and. Uh, Lima. As such, the effects of its power might have been weaker beyond the city itself, at the same time that the absence of the viceroy as the alter ego of the king, as these ceremonies were presided by the highest authority in the region, the governor, might have heightened the importance and very similitude of the king's simulacrum for those observing the ceremony. But this is something that, again, I'm trying to figure out right now. One thing that is rather clear in the case of Manila is that the absence of a vi viceroy in these ceremonies opened up a space for the governor to claim powers akin to those of the king's alter ego, giving way to an endless, com uh, endless complaints about abuses of power, excesses, and corruption on the part of the governor. And I'm getting close to the end here. Um, Baroque ceremonies were also very expensive endeavors. Although these displays of wealth have often been interpreted from a purely economic rationale of cost and benefit, such calculations often ignore the fact that through these public displays of wealth and luxury, cities, viceroys, and subjects stood to benefit politically in the longer uh, term in the form of privileges and favors granted by the new king, which almost always translated into economic gain. The magnificence of the ceremony also sent a strong message to rivaling cities that their city had achieved economic dominance and social magnificence. Baroque ceremonies were embedded in a productive economy of buildings, various manufacturing necessary infrastructure, such as paving of roads and so on. And this is something that I'm also trying to figure out because, um, you know, one of the things that happens during these ceremonies is that there's a lot of reconstruction or new construction that goes on. And often in these cities that have earthquakes, the viceroys pay themselves to reconstruct the church, to you know, pave the streets or reconstruct the city so that it looks appropriate for the ceremony. So it's very productive I mean, in economic terms in that sense. And cities grow and you know, the geography changes through these processes. And this was also uh, embedded in a culture of con conspicuous consumption because everybody had to dress up, essentially, and that, you know, somebody had to make the dresses and uh, all that economy of um, that, that part of the ceremony. At the same time, municipal governments fostered a collective image of their cities and built a historical memory of their constitution as a uh, community through elaborate civic rituals, but also the published chronicles of, of such events. <coughs> 
Printed accounts of royal rituals in viceregal capital, um, capitals constituted cultural capital vis-a-vis -vis provincial cities. These printed relaciones became virtual books of ceremonial etiquette exported to other cities as models for local celebrations and as testaments of the city's power and, and stature. They also constituted a continuation of the performances since their elaborate descriptions were one more uh, uh, monument or a form of literary architecture erected to preserve the memory of such events. These accounts were sponsored by the Cabildo de Audiencia, on occasion the Viceroy, prominent citizens, constituting an important historical source for the city's construction of its own constitution as an orderly republic. In fact, these relaciones are important urban histories. It could be argued that the relaciones de fiestas enjoyed an even more prominent place in the life cycle of cities prone to uh, natural disasters such as Lima, Manila, and Lisbon, as the recurrent earthquakes that repeatedly destroyed the physical city uh, were substituted in the public imagination and the historical record by the magnificent ephemeral structures built for these occasions. As these buildings lingered in the pages of books, the images of the city's ephemeral architecture was made permanent. In short, the reluctance to curb ceremonial expenses should be understood in the context of the political significance that the lavished ceremonies and the circulation of these printed versions had for the creation of an imperial urban geography of power. It was through the performance of these ceremonies that cities developed and cemented their political cultures or civitas. And costly elaborate ceremonies were central to the political culture of allegiance and obedience to the monarch developed by the Habsburgs and that afforded the dynasty a long and relatively peaceful do dominion and enjoyment of a rather large and profitable empire for nearly two centuries. Now to end, Roland Green has argued that while the Baroque emanated from Europe, it got constituted in the New World. As first conceived, the Baroque not only spanned the world that radiated outwards from Europe, from Sicily to Mexico City to Macau, but operated as one of the original cultural idioms across this world, bringing these forms and ideas back to Europe. Serge Gruzinski has made a similar argument about the Baroque as a mestizo cultural, um, cultural form that took and incorporated different elements that then traveled around the world. Jesus Escobar, in his study of the Plaza Mayor in Madrid in the mid 17th century, has noted the influence of Hernán Cortés's description of the plaza and temple of Tenochtitlan in the urban designs and concepts of urban order in this most Habsburg of monuments and cities, as well as on the urban reforms that govern the um, redesign and or building of new cities and plazas throughout the Iberian Peninsula and other parts of Europe after the discovery and conquest of the mainland. Um, a similar argument has been made by Seth Lowe, and my own earlier work showed how what could be loosely termed a European cultural grammar of Baroque ceremonial got reworked and or reinvented in the viceregal context of Lima and beyond. In short, and in my view, the Baroque and modernity were from inception all about distances, geographical, social, political, economic, and cultural, and about the quest to breach those, um, to breach them, but also rationally order those distances and differences. The challenge posed by the effective ruling of a vast empire, where the sun never sets, as Philip II referred to it, gave way to a new space for the exercise of political power and new unprecedented challenges to that power the public space of theatricality that was the city street and the plaza. It was in this space that political culture got made, negotiated, transformed, and perpetuated at this, as this term was then understood. Ultimately, ceremonies dealing with the body of the king, such as his royal proclamation and his exequies, as well as the ceremony of the royal standard performed every year, um, were not mere representations of monarchical power, but constituted a central uh, uh, instance of the actual exercise of his power. In other words, the Baroque spectacle did not create an alternative medium, it was rather the medium in which political and social and cultural issues got played out, contested, transformed, and cemented in practice, all of which was then newly made. Thank you. Let me just finish my
want to end with one image there. I'm going to leave it there. We'll talk about that later. <coughs> Thanks.